so come come uh, fall when you look out your window and you see your neighbor crawling up on their roof and they're running wires and things like that and your significant other just happens to say boy i wonder if those are christmas lights or if they're setting up some sort of surveillance station <laughs> and that maybe the neighbor is spying on us all i think what you're going to hear today is maybe that's true so uh without further ado uh rob who um does something for, for, the, for the federal government, uh, is going to talk to us about his elaborate setup for Christmas lights. Let's give him a big round of applause. Have a great time. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for turning out. Yeah, it's, uh, it's strange to be in Vegas and think about Christmas lights um, in the middle of August. But for me, this actually is a year-round activity, getting ready to build and, uh, and do Christmas displays. And so what I'm hoping here uh, by the end is you understand kind of the, the, the basic components of it and uh, have a little bit of an inspiration and passion. Maybe go out and tinker. The fact that you're here at DEF CON uh, means you might be interested in some of this stuff. And uh, I think that it's well within the, the capability of all of you um, to build an absurd Christmas light show. So this is my house. Oh, 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 oh. Merry Christmas from our family to yours. It's subtle and understated. elements throughout this. All of them are RGB LEDs. I'll talk to more to that throughout the talk. Uh, but the actual controller that is orchestrating all of these maneuvers is a single Raspberry Pi. So pretty cool stuff. So the basic elements, if you're going to build one of these, um, you certainly have to have LEDs, um, lots and lots of LEDs. Um, the power supplies are a challenge, um, not because it's huge amounts of power, um, but they've got to be outside in the weather. Um, where I live, you know, northeast, um, we've got the, the full range. It can be 80 degrees. It can be five degrees, um, and there's always precipitation, whether it's rain, sleet, snow. Um, so there's something. So, so the things you're putting out have to consider the elements in that space. Um, so there's a, there's a number of ways to do waterproof cases. People do things um, as, as simple as tackle boxes and some um, adapting pelican cases, or there's a series of, of boxes you can get um, for meant to be junction boxes for telephone and cable that would mount to your house. Um, you got to worry about the cabling. Um, there's, a, there's an element. So the white box I have up here is a pixel controller, and we'll talk more about those, but that essentially takes um, the network commands and then gets them to the protocols that are needed to drive the lights. All of this is controlled with sequencing software. So um, some people think they drive up, see that display, and what they believe is, you know, the, the audio is playing, the lights are blinking. There's some computer algorithm running in the background that's deciding which lights to turn on and off. That's not the case. You actually have to control each and every LED um, in time. And I'll show you the software we use to do that. Um, the show controller and software, I mentioned that was a Raspberry Pi in my case. And the thing that almost always impresses the average non-technical person is I have a radio station. You drive up, you tune your FM radio to a channel, and you get to hear the music that accompanies the lights. Um, they are so impressed that I'm running a radio station. But that really is just, it's, it's a purchase. You plug it in, and it goes. And we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk some about that. But it essentially takes the headphone out of your, your computer and uh, puts it out onto the FM dial. And everything is um, run, managed, and attached with tons of zip ties. So the traditional mini lights a lot of us grew up with, little incandescent bulbs, they're not very um, energy efficient. They heat up a wire to make light. They're painted to get the color. Um, and uh, you know, you grew up thinking about how the, the local power company would spin your dial when you're running massive amounts of Christmas lights. Technology's come a long way, and now everything in my display is LED-driven. 
And they're, uh, you know, DEF CON's been good enough to give all of us examples of these, but the, the basic element in all of this is a, an LED chip that has three different color LEDs on one substrate, a red, a green, and a blue. And they're in such close proximity that your eye sees them as one pixel. So what they actually do, it's like shining three flashlights together. So you make additive color. So you, um, by varying the intensity of each of those three colors, um, you can create across the spectrum and actually add together to get almost any color in the visible spectrum. You can go from off all the way out to all three on gives you white and then you can get in between the various shades um, and the software controls all of that. So when these pixels first came out, they were called smart RGB as opposed to just RGB because what they had was a small controller chip and if you look inside the one um, LED that's running horizontally, you can see a black um, integrated circuit that's mounted there to control those three LEDs. And that was the thing that takes three signals, um, it takes uh, a, an intensity for red, an intensity for green, and an intensity for blue, and converts those digital values out to um, the intensity of the LEDs. So the smart LEDs let you send a command to each pixel and change its color individually. So you can see on that bundle of strings, um, and, and I'll show you later in a, in a demo, if the, the demo gods help me, um, we'll, we'll see that you can individually change colors along that string. They don't all have to be the same color and remain the same color. So that integrated circuit comes in multiple forms. Um, I have the, the white strip running down the display. It's also the rolled up reel in the, uh, in the video image. That's a, um, that's a form where that's a flexible printed circuit card. Um, the chip is separate and then you can see two LEDs with one controller chip, two white boxes with each controller chip. Um, there's a lot of different form factors. Today they are starting to integrate um, the, the actual LED onto the same substrate as the controller chip. So the way they work. Um, it's a serial protocol, so I don't have to have an address for each and every um, pixel. You can extend the strings out um, indefinitely. Now there's some realistic um, limitations to the amount of power you can push down the string. Um, but what happens is three values come out and then they're followed by three more values, three more values, and you can think of it like a stack of colored Lego blocks. So the first pixel controller they hit will grab that first set of three colors um, instructions, pull it off the top and display it, and then it'll push out the rest of the stack onto the next pixel in the chain. So it, it, it first in, first out, but it strips that first one off the head and, uh, and moves them down the line. So um, for my display, every 50 milliseconds, there's a new color going into every pixel in that display. So there are huge amounts of data moving through the, uh, um, through the network. Um, and, and out to these uh, out to these strings. The good news is, as tinkerers and hobbyists, you don't have to understand this protocol. You can dig in, and if you really want to get hardcore and build the hardware yourself, um, you can generate these serial protocols. You can learn about how to talk to the strings. Um, but there's a lot of smart folks who have already built the controller cards and built the hardware um, and make it available either in finished form or kit forms um, that you can play with. So at the core of my display are these, um, are, are these elements and oh, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way in there. Um, so what you see and if you walk up afterwards, I'm going to go to the chill out lounge and you can look at some of the tech up close, but there's multiple form factors for the LEDs. The bottom center is a, known as a bullet pixel. Um, they look like a small bullet. You can push them through um, display items and mount them that way. The square nodes um, have ears for you to, uh, to screw down and the strips themselves are flexible and can be tie wrapped and, and, uh, and attached to different things. In customizing, you've got to cut these up, you've got to string them for your specific display, you've got to adapt them to your house. So my 
the 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 run along my eaves is going to be the it is going to be different than my neighbor's house is going to be different than anybody else's house so in the end you wind up chopping these to various lengths adding them together a lot of soldering soldering is a core technology or a, a core skill you will need to do if you're into the hobby um, build and put things together and we also connectorize most of the things you saw me assembling up here frantically before the demo um, to get everything together um, Plugging in and having waterproof connectors on the uh, on the display allows you to tear it down, store it, put it away um, for the um, uh, for the season. So my house has um, a series of custom elements that I've built. So the story about how I got into this um, started a number of years ago, five or six years ago. We were going by a house in a neighborhood and they had um, just a fabulous show. They had lights on the house, they had the FM radio tune, they had really cool um, elements all synchronized. I looked at it and I said, that is neat, right? Computer geeky guy, I was excited. My l wife loved kind of the, the, the way it moved and captured everybody's attention. I said, I think I can do that. And she looked and turned and said, sure, sure you can. So. I heard, yes, yes you can. <laughs> and so when the boxes started showing up in February from China with piece parts, and she's like, what the hell is this? I said, it's the Christmas light display you said I could do. <laughs> All right, so those of you who didn't bring your spouse, you can go home, boxes will start showing up. Um, it's, uh, it's expanded and built over the years. So as I mentioned, there's a bunch of elements. Each one of those is uh, individually um, designed and fitted. There's no big kit you get that will, uh, that will set up your house. Um, so the first year I did it, um, I had the outlines along the house. Um, that was um, this flexible strip mounted to PVC pipes and zip tied to the eaves, zip tied to the pillars, things like that. So all of the outline of the house. Those three swooping arches are, um, are PVC pipe with lights strung through the inside of them and they kind of diffuse. Um, those were part of the first year. And then the star um, down on the ground, the large red and white star you see. Um, my son dubbed that the seizure star because all of these elements, I didn't know how to do them. I didn't know how they were going to work. So I had all this stuff in my basement and I was tinkering throughout the year to get it to work, get it to look right, understand how they would work. And that thing is amazingly bright. All of this is actually pretty incredibly bright if you're four or five, six feet away. Um, so testing it in the basement, um, it, it, was, uh, it was a blinding experience. So we had those. Um, that was the first year. Um, and I'm sorry, the small trees in the very front. So those are chicken, or those are um, tomato cages, upside down, and then lights wrapped around them. Um, and there's ten of those. So so I had those as the basic element, and it looked pretty cool. It was uh, it was a nice setup, but it's uh, it's a little bit of an addiction. So every year it's got to be a little bigger, a little better. Um, I wound up second year. Um, I added the floodlights, so if you notice the, uh, the, the green kind of painting the house, um, those are three floodlights on the top, three on the bottom. Those also are RGB. They're controlled the same way. Those are just a single pixel to the computer, um, and they bring so much more depth uh, to this display, so I was really happy to add those. Um, and I'm sorry, the Christmas trees were a second year ad, so the second year was the small trees and the, uh, the, the floodlights. Um, Third year saw me add um, a, a, a number of things, which is to include that that large tree, and I'll talk more about that tree on the side. That's the one you saw with the um, with the uh, the graphics running on it. And then over my garage is a um, is a small matrix sign that I can run text and pictures and and abstract colors. Um, that's actually a large amount of pixels in a very dense form factor. I'll talk to those. And then up along the top row, you can see the snowflakes. Those are um, purchased items. Um, they're they're pre-cut from plastic corrugated cardboard, plasticized corrugated cardboard. Um, it's called Coro. And there's companies that will cut them, laser cut them, and pre-drill them. So you push those 
bullet pixels through the center. Um, and then you can um, include those in your display and you can do a lot of patterns on them and around them. Similarly, the small wreath um, on the first floor is another piece of Coro um, with push through pieces. So those are the, the elements I've done. Um, last year I added no hardware. I was working at the White House, I had no time, but I added software. Um, so when you get a base amount, it's really easy from year to year to add a little thing here, a little thing there. Um, and, uh, and increment the display. So I talked about the tree on the side. Um, those, are, um, those are known as mega trees. Um, it's, uh, it's pixel strings and it lets us do animation and effects. It's in essence a low resolution matrix. Mine is um, 50 pixels tall, um, 32 pixels wide, and it's 14 feet tall. So let me go back and put that into perspective. Um, so that's 14 feet, it's taller than the first story in my house. It really dominates um, the scenery, right? It draws the eye, especially if you've got a moving picture on it. Um, that's good and bad. That was one of the reasons I felt like I could get away without adding new hardware last year, was I had a really good platform uh, to put new stuff on and I added new songs. So in that mega tree, those are just strings of those bullet pixels inside a small plastic strip um, that has holes pre-drilled in it and I push the, push the pixels through, D-link at the top and uh, there's companies that will make headers up top or if you're, uh, if you're handy, um, there's a number of uh, good plans on top to essentially put hooks that you can, you can hang stuff on. They run down the 14 feet and I've got 10 stakes in the ground um, that, that hold them in the ground and if you look at the tree you can see through um, as those are all lit. So there's gaps, there's several inches of gaps but as you're at the street level and look at it, um, it does a great job being a small display um, for whatever you want to put on it, whether it's colors, patterns or other things. Um, and they're, they're, um, they're an impressive addition um, to any display because of the amount of things you can add to them. I talked about the floodlights. Um, the difference um, that it made on, my, made on my house, if you look at the far left picture, um, very dark and, and, uh, and you know, sparse between the elements. When you start to add the colors in between, um, it, it just changes the whole look of the house. Um, so I'll switch from here from the concepts of what we built to how you make it run. So the, the pixels themselves, um, you want to be able to control from a computer. So there's a protocol um, that runs over Ethernet. It's streaming ACN. It's a standard protocol for the control of lights um, over Ethernet. And we're not in a normal venue, but if you think about stage lighting and all of those, um, the, the, the lights you would, you would see in any sort of concert or disco venue, um, this was developed for that area. And it was, um, a lot of those are controlled with colored lights and it can stream out um, values. Um, you can push it out um, unicast to a single IP address or multicast where it broadcasts the packets throughout the whole network and it, it because of the legacy infrastructure is broken up into smaller chunks of data. You don't have to understand this protocol, you don't have to program to it because people have crowdsourced and open sourced all of this technology and there's, um, there's amazing projects um, supported by the community that, that will deal with it. But the concept of you got to get out of something in Ethernet and it's going to talk in a known protocol to a controller. So the controllers, this is what's inside that gray box. Um, it's an Ethernet to uh, pixel controller. This is one of the favorites in the industry. This is about um, $200, um, but if you look at the green, um, the green connectors along the bottom, there's, uh, there's um, 16 connectors for, um, for various strings. You can, have a, um, you can have hundreds of LEDs per connector, um, and there's even a daughter board that will double the connectors and double the light outputs. So it will take the Ethernet in and then convert it to the protocol that the, uh, the strings need. Um, the best controllers have web-based interfaces and I didn't have my display up while I was testing and controlling these, but I was just controlling over, um, uh, over a web browser the setup and, and, uh, and configuration of those lights. So it lets you test, it lets you remap, um, it lets you as you add things to the display, um, put those in there. Um, 
along the bottom, the, the gold yellow things are um, auto fuses. So each of the pixel strings is fused. They're DC elements, usually running 5 volts or 12 volts. And uh, um, sometimes bad things happen with water and power. Um, so having fuses there, I've seen cases where people have shorted, gotten to the point where um, they've melted elements um, or even started small fires when they haven't had fusing. And this, uh, the, the best projects have fusing within them as well. And then one thing that has to happen is you've got to drive all of these pixels. So in my display, every 50 milliseconds, every single pixel, and there's tens of thousands of pixels are getting a new um, set of data um, running out to the lights. Um, this is an automated set of software that for me starts the lights up every day at about 5.15. Um, it sequences through about 15 different songs and then loops back around and it does that all the way until 10 at night. So it puts them on a schedule, it streams the, the data to the controllers. You can have a dedicated PC or there's an element called a, uh, uh, the Falcon Pi player which uses a, a Raspberry Pi. Um, you pre-compile all the data that's going to go out and this thing just shoves data out the Ethernet port um, very cheaply, very reliably and controls, like I said, all of those various pro um, parts and pieces. My show is um, sequenced and aligned to music. There's millisecond control of the lights and it has to get the data across all of those uh, elements. One thing that is nice, and I'll give a demo here in a few minutes, is you're able to um, simulate the show without the hardware there. We can run these pieces of technology and you can do development on your desktop workshop. You don't have to have that seizure star sitting in the basement blinding you while you're, uh, while you're doing your work. Um, but seeing it on the display is always um, a little bit different than the, the simulation. And uh, one of the really cool things is because of the kind of the coalescing around this software is sequences can be shared and, ad and adapted. And I will show you an example of that um, uh, in, in a minute as well as um, you saw the opening PNET sequence. Um, that's one I did last year and I, crowd, I, I open sourced that. I posted it to the uh, Christmas light forums and now there were, um, there were 50 or 100 different houses around the world running my song on their house. Now they may not have had the same display elements, but this software lets them adapt and uh, um, move things into and out of the displays um, with pretty good ease. So right here is the, uh, the software and I've got this in case my demo fails and here's where I'm gonna switch over and start to tempt the demo gods a little bit. Sorry. All right, so if you look on the left side, there's a display of my house. And along here is a timeline with an audio wave file. And down below are all the various elements. So this line I just highlighted are the floodlights in my house. So coming up in a few seconds, it will be running the floodlights directly floodlights running. If you notice they came on before that where there's a blank space, that's because I have an element that is everything in the house and I'm doing something there. But what this graphic interface lets you do is pick a type of, uh, um, a type of display element. So I can take fire and I can put it on my whole house Sorry, I've got other display elements running there. I'm going to flip over to the other live demo. I just told it to recompile that whole display. That's what's running down here. So if I take the whole house
So it will adapt. I'm not going to be able to do it on this one. Apologies. Let me flip over. I'll go to the live demo with my lights. All right, so the other thing it can do, it can control the lights live. And where I am now is running through where I have a sequence pushing up and down the strings. And I've got text going on to the display. But the graphic interface lets me pull an effect like all the sequence. on all the strings and run them red. I am getting no love from my demos. All right, so there's a butterfly rainbow effect I drag down, and I can tell it for how many milliseconds across the time I want to drop that on. I can do that across a single string. I can do it across multiple strings um, or various elements of the display. So it's a graphic and uh, user interface. Newbies can grab it. Despite the problems I had up here um, doing it live in front of you, um, it's an easy way to go and try the elements, see what they look like on the uh, on your um, your your um, notional architecture of your house, and then do development all year long as you're um, as you're ready <coughs> to get these things together. flip back over and hop out of the demo space. So the other thing you can use besides the big controllers I talked about are Raspberry Pis. Um, the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pis can drive these lights directly and independently themselves. Um, you can't get the same quantities that you do with the hard, um, with the, the large controllers, um, but they're a cheap way to get started. You can make small elements for your house, um, and as you're building something new up, um, you, can, you can add them, prototype them, and then put them in the larger display letter, later. There are daughter cards for Raspberry Pis that are easier than going directly on the pins and what they do is buffer the data going out so you can drive 12 volt and 5 volt pixels. Um, one daughter card will drive up to 800 pixels. Um, they will have, there's options for real time clocks in there to keep them synchronized. Um, they're an easy way to get, uh, get dabbling into the hobby. Where do the pixels come from? I bought my pixels directly from China. There's ways to do these in pre-sales where um, people band together. Um, we're a little late in the season for the pre-sales, but January, February, March, people will buy together, get a whole container shipped over from China. One person will divvy it out and then send them to you, um, saving you money. There are places on eBay and Amazon that sell them. I would recommend against them. I would recommend you go to a specialty seller that serves the, the Christmas light uh, hobbyists. And at the end, I've got a link for where you can, uh, you can find um, the, the folks who do this um, with, uh, um, with Facebook groups, um, some, some uh, internet boards, um, and places um, for mailing lists. They will help you immensely in figuring out what's a good price, what's a good place to buy, and who's reputable. There's two different form factors and voltages for these. There's 5-volt pixels and 12-volt pixels. 
people debate back and forth which are easier and which are better. The good thing about five volts, they're a little cheaper. Um, and uh, um, the 12 volts um, let you run a longer string without the, de the, uh, the degradation from long lengths. If you start to run these and you go too far out, the most power efficient LED is the red one and it will start to turn pink in your colors if you're trying to do white because the, the green and blue will be starved for power and the red will dominate over dominate. So a lot of people use 12 volt, uh, 12 volt pixels in their display. The other thing we have is a, a matrix display. These are panels developed for Vegas and other places where you see the massive LED signs. Um, so these are five to seven dollars a piece and they stack together. I've got four of them up there t um, in a display node. What they will let you do is adapt text. I use in my display um, one of these to, to run graphics and words and uh, um, tell people what channel my FM radio is on um, so they can tune, uh, uh, tune their radio. And uh, behind each of those is running some sort of computer um, to control and get the pixels out to it. There's a BeagleBone Unix Raspberry Pi-like device that you can run up to 64 of those panels. Um, and a Raspberry Pi will be able to control a dozen of them. So the one you see up there is, um, is four tall by three wide. Um, so tens of thousands of pixels, but it lets me do a lot of interesting things in the display. I talked earlier about the water issue. Um, you have to buy weather rated lights. There are some that come without protective coatings. Um, those will be cheaper, but those also won't work. The first time you hit rain, you're done. Um, a lot of silicone caulk is used if you have the strips, which are plasticized tubes to seal the end. Um, and I talked earlier about some of the ways you can enclose your electronics. Thing you've got to be careful about in certain parts of the country is how to cool it. If you make something watertight, it may be, um, it, it may be um, generating too much heat um, inside that watertight place. Um, so thinking about cooling and other um, topics are good. I talked a little bit about the challenges you run into. One is the voltage drop. You can't pull, push enough current through to supply all those lights um, and they'll turn pink. But you can, at various layers along the display, inject new voltage and just pull that both up. So power at both ends of the strip or even in the middle um, helps. The other challenge you'll run into is distance to the first pixel. So these are um, these are digital signals, um, but often run on crummy wires. And so if you're trying to drive something 100 feet before the first pixel you're talking to, the noise grows and you'll get corrupted data. What people have done is you can put what's known as a null pixel in the, uh, in the string along the way and it'll regenerate the signal. So one thing the pixels do, every time they get data in, they regenerate the waves going back out and they fix up the signal so a pixel along the way that doesn't actually turn on um, will, uh, will allow the, the data to continue. This is my FM radio station. It's about three inches square. I bought one from um, New Zealand as a kit. The kit consists of hooking the power connector onto it because it might push out a little more power than the FCC will allow them to sell directly. Um, but I will assure you here at Black Hat, since this is being taped, that I am well within the FCC regulations and not over transmitting. Um, so one of the things you gotta do, you gotta pick an open channel. Um, if you try to broadcast over the local radio station, they're likely going to dominate you. And if not, you dominate them, is going to bring the FCC in to look at you. Um, there is a, there's a great database that will show you where the licensed stations are in your area, and the, the, the link is up there. Um, but uh, you know, just finding tuning through, um, finding open channels is, uh, is the easiest way. And what, uh, what the folks um, you know, skilled in the RF work will tell you, the antenna makes a really big difference. Um, when I wound up cutting an antenna for my frequency, um, I got so much clearer signal. Um, you know, you're trying to drive it out, not, uh, not miles, but, uh, but hundreds of feet. 
but you want a nice clear signal. And uh, what what I found is um, tuning your antenna makes a makes a huge difference. So basic skills: soldering, debugging, planning, logical thinking. Um, every year, um, I spend about three days putting my display up. Um, I start. Um, and try to have it ready to turn on about Thanksgiving night. And uh, the last 10% is where I spend most of my time just worrying about the, the, the little gremlins that pop up in any large um, kind of uh, gerrymandered uh, uh, display. Um, so, so attention to detail, figuring out how to connect and display um, will be good. So I'm getting ready for next year. Um, the thing I'm going to be working on, and you'll see the animated graphics right there, is a chipmunk sequence. I talked to you about the fact that people, uh, people crowdsource and open source stuff. I have found an awesome place, Fiverr.com. Um, you can subcontract gig graphics out, and I work with people all over the world to help me with these, these animations and then uh, build them together and put them together in terms of song. So I'll work on this next couple months and uh, come October, November, I'll push that out there for the community to use and, and, and uh, play with. The other thing I'm working on is another element for the display. Uh, this is currently sitting in my basement. That's a, uh, that's a large spray. If you look, the center piece is seven feet, six feet, five feet, four feet. And what this will let me do is other custom display elements that work a little differently than, uh, than the stuff I have. So I think this will be a nice addition. Again, if, because I can treat it like seven parallel matrix lines, um, it'll be really easy to do things up to and probably including text effects on it. So, how's this all come together? I said, you know, building absurd Christmas-like songs. So, I've pushed out the Charlie Brown. I'm going to push out the, the, the Chipmunks this year. Um, one of the things uh, somebody inspired me to, to share um, had done was he built a Star Wars sequence. So, this isn't the whole thing, but it'll give you a sense of how you can really, no kidding, get absurd with these Christmas lights. One of the most popular songs in my in my show. Star Wars has been running the new movie over the holidays almost every year, so it still stays fairly relevant and fresh. Again, going with that subtle and understated. to run Halloween. So, All right, so out on Twitter, my, my Twitter, RGB underscore lights, um, I tweeted out this link as well. So if you don't catch it here, you can go ahead and uh, get the link online. But this has a three-page PDF with places to buy lights, the equipment I recommend, um, the, the online resources you can get together and, uh, and build your own absurd Christmas light show. So thanks for your time. I'm going to go to the chill-out room. If anybody has detailed questions, I'm happy to talk lights. Thanks.